Without further ado, I give you Aaron Goldberg. Thank you guys. Good morning. This is Jazz Morning. It's technically afternoon. Uh, yeah, I had a great couple of days with you all. It was inspiring to hear everybody play last night and uh, play a little bit. And as, as I was saying, I, I had a little chance to sit in Del Fields band, it's not, that's like a true New Orleans experience you cannot get in New York. Um, I think you guys all know this already, but I, in my opinion, New Orleans is uh, America's greatest city. Uh, you know, people, you, you could fight it out with the New Yorkers, but definitely, at the very least, New York and New Orleans are America's two greatest cities, and they're also, of course, America's two greatest jazz cities. But I always get inspired when I come here because I, it, it really is extraordinarily different from New York. And the two energies are kind of complementary. You know, you, you could conceivably like have a little too much fun down here and get a little lazy and complacent, and then you go to New York and it kicks your ass and <laughs> pushes you. But you could also easily get sucked up into the New York stress and <clears throat> anxiety and you know, helter skelter, and you come back down here and you realize like why you love this music so much and where it came from, because in New York, there's no history. Everything is immediately erased to make room for the next thing. And here you feel the history every second of everything that ever transpired here, the whole history of America and of course the history of the music. And uh, jazz makes more sense here mm -hmm. than it does in New York. Um, so I, you know, I, I always recommend, especially like European jazz students who really need, or, or you know, even people from South America, Central America, who don't grow up in America, you know, to come here because this is where it started and it really makes a lot more sense. If you spend some time here, I've always wanted to come down. Now I had a little, got inspired to have a little plan, get four New York friends like John Ellis and other people that love New Orleans and, uh, you know, find a little place somewhere in the Marigny or somewhere and share the rent and just let them come down and Carl Allen, maybe he'll join in. So uh, maybe you guys will see more of me in the near future. Uh, my idea for the clinic was just to spend a few minutes, like not more than five or ten minutes, talking, like to tell you a little bit about how I uh, became a jazz musician and a few things I learned along the way, answering questions anybody might have about either anything I said or played or you know anything that came up in your head over the past day or two, and then invite some of you guys up to play, maybe play a tune with you, and then invite a pianist to play and, and just try to give some constructive criticism. Maybe some people I haven't heard because some of the cats I heard yesterday played with and there's some other of you that I haven't heard, so that would be nice. Does that sound reasonable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so, uh, I, you know, I did not grow up in a jazz-friendly home. I, I, I'm definitely not the child of musicians. I'm not even really the child of jazz lovers or aficionados. I, I think my parents were aware of jazz. They, they certainly had heard of, you know, Dave Brubeck and Louis Armstrong, maybe, if we're lucky. But uh, they love classical music. They love music, I'll give them that. And they both played a little bit of piano when they were kids. So we had a piano in the house, uh, inherited from my grandfather. And, uh, you know, I think, like many parents, they wanted their kids to be kind of well-rounded and try a little bit of everything. So taking piano lessons was like a thing that the kid should do because he's your kid. So uh, I just, you know, had a little neighborhood piano teacher and I learned some classical pieces. And my parents would try to get to, sh you know, get me to sh show off what I knew to their friends and so they could be proud of their little kid, basically. But there was no... Uh, let's say not in their wildest nightmares would I have ever become a professional musician, <coughs> let alone a jazz musician, which they didn't know anything about. But, uh, you know, they were the kind of parents that had kind of planned out my life in advance. And uh, I guess in their vision of things, I would have gone to medical school or uh, maybe, maybe law school or something like that. Um, so it was very hard for them to kind of let go of, of their plan. So in, in retrospect, you know, it's very possible that I, I got super passionate about jazz because they didn't know shit about it. 
<laughs> and it was something magnificent that was purely mine. Um, when I, you know, as opposed to theirs. <laughs> um, so I was just lucky. I went to a high school where there was a, a math teacher who was a jazz bass player by night, and uh, he had. I'm on video, so I should be careful what I say, but uh, he, he was in danger of being fired as a math teacher because he was out every night playing jazz gigs instead of correcting his kids' exams. And uh, he very savvily convinced the, the head of the school to let him teach jazz instead of math, which was a lucky move for me and for him too. And he's since become an amazing jazz educator. He was actually just last year president of the Jazz Educators Network, Jen. And uh, he's phenomenally good at taking high school kids who have never heard a note of jazz before and turning them into, at, at minimum, jazz lovers. Uh, not many of us actually went on to be professional jazz musicians, maybe just two of us over the, his 40 years of 30 years of teaching. But it's not, it's not Noka, put it like that. But, uh, but he, he is an amazingly good um, sort of like lover of jazz and transmits the love of his love of the music to all his students so he's at least making a lot of jazz fans and I was one of those kids that just heard the music and got hooked and um, I also having come wholly from a classical background I had no notion in my head how it was possible that music could be improvised and the fact that this music sounded so amazing and then he swore to me that they were just making it up as they went along See, like a big lie, like that. that couldn't possibly be true. Uh, so I got hooked partly on just the beauty and the soulfulness of the music and also partly on the puzzle of how it was possible to improvise great music. And uh, I mean, the, the most important moment of my jazz education was the summer before I had a class. I was, I guess, 13 or 14 before my first jazz class. And, in the mail, I received this cassette from him, this jazz teacher, his name is Bob Sinecro. And it was, you know, 1988 or something like that. So long before CDs. And it was a little, like, mixtape, homemade cassette of eight tunes. Max L, I, I, I still know what it looked like. Green Max L. And it had uh, So What, Moanin', Autumn Leaves, uh, Blue Bassa. Blues in the Closet. Um, what else? Olio. Maybe one more too. And uh, Straight No Chaser. A milestone. So I didn't know anything about anything. I didn't know what I was listening to. I couldn't tell the difference between alto saxophone and tenor saxophone. I didn't know, you know, that. Winton, I thought that Winton Kelly was like an Irish kid because all the kids in my school were named Kelly and Tommy Flanagan. They were like all the Irish names of the kids who went to school. <laughs> so I thought, I didn't know it was African American music. I didn't know anything about it. <clears throat> but there was a little note that said, you know, homework for j first year jazz class. Listen to this cassette. Summer homework for the first year. Listen to this cassette. So I had a little Walkman. I don't know if you guys remember Walkman, but I was a, you know, studious. 14 year old and so I did my homework I listened to that cassette and you know it was the only homework I had for the whole summer so I did it every day I listened to the cassette every day and if, if you listen to good music any kind of good music every day and I didn't own many cassettes at the time so I pretty much just listened to that uh, you will fall in love with it and of course this music is the richest music that there is so by the end of the you know summer I was singing along with every tune and I didn't know what was what, but I just liked it. And so I showed up for class, and many of the other kids in my class had had some experience improvising. Like maybe they had a rock band or a blues band, and they could play some blues scale. And I'm still best friends with one of the other piano students, and uh, he was my roommate like 30 years later. But, uh, you know, I knew nothing. I was probably the weakest of all students. I couldn't even tell you what an F triad was or you know, I didn't know what a chord was, I didn't know anything. I could play some rock on and on. <laughs> but, uh, so I started from zero. But what I realized is that I was kind of progressing faster. I didn't realize this at first, but like by the second or third year I realized that I was progressing faster than the other kids. 
because I just had more vocabulary in my head already just from listening. And I realized that it was actually just love for the music that really is the difference between you know becoming a successful musician, jazz musician, probably any kind of music, and, and, and not. The kids that already kind of knew what they were doing, they blew it off as like, oh yeah, listen, I got my stuff. I like listening to the Allman Brothers. I like listening to Little Feet. I got my music, you know. I didn't have my music. That, be, that was my music, that cassette. And then, you know, from there, got some more cassettes. <laughs> my whole jazz collection was cassettes for the first, like, four or five years. Um, and I, so that was the thing that, and, and the teacher was very, very clear about that, that the real way to learn this music was to listen. And uh, what goes in comes out. So that's pretty much my teaching philosophy at this point. Like I think that everything that you guys learn, you can get from the records. And that's exactly how Bird and Coltrane and Miles got all of their stuff. They got it from the records. The, the real teachers are you know, McCoy Tyner and, and Red Garland. Wes Montgomery and, and Freddie Hubbard. Teachers like us along the way, the best thing we, we can do is you know hear you from the outside and, and try to diagnose maybe some bad habits that you picked up along the way and correct those. But you know, even your private teachers, I think their job is not to necessarily give you information because all the information is there on the records, and if you and if you engage in the process immerse yourself in the process of getting it from the records in the oral tradition, listening, singing along, trying to figure out what you hear, that process will, will give you the training that you need and the skills you need to become a successful great jazz musician. If you don't engage in the process and you try to get it from a book or directly from a teacher as information um, that you learn in a methodical way, it's not, you're not going to develop the skills that you need. So there's a reason why all the cats that are great learn by ear from records and to a certain degree also just from hanging out together. So that's the the beauty of the jazz school. You know, if you don't really learn jazz, I hope you guys don't kick me out for saying this. If you if nobody really learns jazz in a classroom on a chalkboard by paying, you know, luckily here not that much money, but in New York fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, how do you learn it? In a jazz school you learn it in a community playing with your fellow students and hopefully with your teachers and by checking out stuff and talking to each other. What are you listening to? What are you listening to? I, I spent a year after high school at the new school, 91, 92. You know, my fellow students were Roy Hargrove, Brad Meldow, Abishai Cohen, the bass player. A lot of Larry Goldings, Peter Brunson had just graduated, so they were still hanging around. I never saw those guys in class. Roy Hargrove came to class once. <laughs> and that was because he wanted to flirt with the singer in the, in the ensemble. And he came in, like flirted, played a couple solos and left. And I also never saw Brad in class, but I did see him all the time in the practice room playing duo piano with Larry Goldings. Wow. Just, just hanging out. Um, and the practice rooms were such that there was no soundproof, no soundproofing between rooms and they were just one against another, little upright pianos. So if you would go in the practice room, you would hear everything that everybody else in every other practice room was practicing. So inevitably, you would engage with all of the other people practicing, and pretty soon you were kind of playing duets with whoever was in the next room, and then you were hearing stuff from the other room, you'd come over and say, hey, I'll come, on, come on and play, and then you'd end up just playing with whoever else happened to be there, which was actually the best way to practice, because you can't get great at this music just sitting in a room practicing by yourself. It's all about the community engagement and, and learning to listen and play at the same time, like I was saying in this class before. So that was actually, the new school was kind of designed intentionally to be a non-traditional jazz learning environment by Arnie Lawrence and Reggie Workman, the guys who started it, because they knew that the right way to teach jazz was the oral tradition. And you weren't really going to use it in the classroom, yet nevertheless they wanted to get credit. So it had to look like it was a real university with classes and teachers and faculty you had to pay money to go there, but you know, my, I had a jazz composition class with Bob Belden that did not meet once the entire semester. And uh, the first day of class, there was a note on the door that said, uh, the late, great Bob Belden, who I loved very much, uh, said, call me Bob. <laughs> Left his number. This was before cell phones, so I remember going to the payphone on the corner 
and call in. Uh, Mr. Belden? Yeah, yeah, who's this? Uh, this is Aaron Goldberg. I'm in your jazz composition class. Oh, hey, hey man, yeah. Uh, what are you doing Wednesday? Well, I have class until 1. And I said, okay, 3 o'clock. Write down this address. Gave me his home address, 3 o'clock. I went over to Bob Belden's house, rang the bell. I was 17, you know, distinct smell of pot emanating from the <laughs> apartment into the hallway. You know, uh, he's like, hi, hey man, come in. He had a big old black leather couch in the middle of this room. Sit down, I sat down, I looked around, and he had his living room was not this big, but maybe half the size of this room. So I cut it in half. Every wall, floor to ceiling, was vinyl, not cassettes, vinyl. Must have had 20 or 30,000 vinyls, all organized, and a big old mag magnificent stereo. And he's like, oh, okay, uh, who are your favorite pianists? It's like, Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea. Okay, perfect, great, great. And he spent the next four hours giving me blindfold tests of records that I didn't even know existed, like obscure blue notes and stuff that had never been released with early Herbie and Chick, where Chick sounded like Herbie and Herbie sounded a little bit like Chick. And I was getting more and more high and more and more confused. <laughs> and I just started thinking like maybe there weren't really two different guys named Herbie and Chick, they were just the same guy. <laughs> He was happy and we were happy. And, and I left and then I came to class the next week. Opened the door, not, nobody there. No note, nothing. I never saw anybody else in the class. I didn't know who to ask. I came one more time, opened the class. No, no, no class, nobody in there. So I called Bob again like the fourth week. Hey, Mr. Belden, uh, are we going to have class this semester? And he said, oh, uh, what's the last day of class? And I said, I don't know, I think it's December. He's like, no, let me know, uh, do you have it written somewhere? I was like, yeah, hold on. Like, okay, uh, last day of class, December 6th. He's like, okay, December 10th, midnight, come to Avatar Studios. You know where that is? I was like, no. Look it up, midnight, December 10th, Avatar Studio. I was like, okay, is there any, uh, is there any homework? He's like, yeah, uh, write a tune. Bring it, bring it, <laughs> December 10th, Avatar Studio. <laughs> okay. So, I was studious, you know, I did my homework, I wrote a tune, I brought it midnight, December 10th, to Avatar Studios. I walked up the stairs, you know, there's the receptionist looking for Mr. Belden. Oh, yeah, Studio B. Came to Studio B, and there was Bob Belden at, in the big, amazing Studio B of Avatar with a uh, Adam Holtzman and Rocky Bryant and a whole band of cats, you know, that had played with Miles. And uh, me and one other student who had also done the homework and, and brought it to Studio B at midnight. And uh, he introduced us to musicians and he copied our little handwritten charts and he placed them in front of the cats and they played our tunes. And I got a cassette with my tune being played by these guys. And I got an A for the semester. <laughs> and so did the other student. And I assume everybody else got an F. I don't know. Uh, Bob Belden did get fired from the new school. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's one of the greatest arrangers, composers that ever lived and uh, worked with all the baddest cats. And I, I realized many years later, and that's the reason I'm telling the story, that actually I learned something very, very important from Bob Belden. That was Bob Belden's way of teaching me and the other students that you do not learn how to write in a classroom. You do not learn really anything to do with jazz in a classroom. You learn everything to do with jazz by, you can leave out the, you know, the marijuana part, but listening to all of these records and in a self, hopefully self-directed way, working on your art, you know? If it's writing tunes, by writing tunes. If it's improvising, by practicing your improvisation, based on the work of these master musicians that have left their legacy for us, recorded legacy. And uh, everything else is just a plot to take your money. <laughs> so, 
yeah, of course he got fired. <laughs> but, you know, and the other new school teachers that I had that were good, they had a, a way of kind of imparting the same wisdom without going to such an extreme, right? So, um, you know, that was a very valuable year, and I also got the same lesson from the example of the other students, you know, who everybody came to ensemble class because it was fun, and it was about playing, and that's really what it's about. So, play as much as you can. Everybody was talking to everybody else about what, your, what record they were checking out. Hey, have you heard of Chet Baker at Things That Could Happen to You? Oh, no. Hey, copy my cassette. So, you know, I copied the cassette, and pretty soon, like, everybody in the school was singing along with every Chet Baker solo on that record. And it was a little community of guys that were all checking out the same stuff. Have you heard, uh, you know, Smoking at the Half? No, oh, no, no. Oh, and then everybody could quote, you know, Wynton Kelly and Wes's solo on Unit 7. And it was a little, you know, family. We were like a little jazz family. We'd go out and hear Kenny Barron one night, we'd go out and hear Mulder Miller the next night, we'd go out and hear Joe Henderson and Freddie Hubbard the next night. And, uh, you know, we'd dream about, like, getting a call to play with Hank Jones. You know, one bass player, one of my friends, got a gig with Hank Jones, and we all went to see him play Zinos. And, and the older I mean, musicians of our, you know, that generation were still around. So you could get the call from Joe Henderson to play with Joe Henderson. You could get the call. I, I got the call from Freddie Hubbard, played some gigs with Freddie Hubbard. I played with Betty Carter. You know, I played with Joe Henderson. When I, I had these little formative, magical experiences cats of my generation, um, students of my generation still had. And then there were like superstars like Roy Hargrove, who didn't just get like a, a gig with somebody. He was on the scene playing with all those guys all the time at 22, 23 years of age. So the, this, this oral tradition, you know, of learning from the elders, both in person and off of record, that was really what school was about. And I, I feel that it's still here in New Orleans, the, the oral tradition of teaching jazz is alive and well here in a way that it's not at 99% of jazz schools. Even in New York, it's, it's not to the degree that I think it should be. Even at the new school, the new new school itself, um, it's still like that in pockets of the new school. But there's, a, there's something to be said for that looseness. Of course, there's also something to be said for you know, some organization because many students got lost in the new school. I mean, some students even die. You know, there was a lot of you know drug abuse among students at the time, like that doesn't exist anymore. That's a beautiful thing. Um, the scene is also like much more uh, racially integrated now, in a, in a beautiful way. Like there's no in New York, and of course here too. I, I feel nothing, no racial tension of any kind. Of course, it's out there in the society at large, but in the jazz community, uh, that wasn't so true in the '80s and early '90s. There were still some issues. Victor could speak to too. I'm sure, and that, that is gone, long gone, which is a beautiful thing. Anyway, so it's not all about like the golden age, uh, but there's certain things that I feel lucky to have uh, grown up with in my jazz education that I try to impart to you know, students now. So you guys are getting it, you know, you're getting it from the source. Um, that's a beautiful thing. So anyway, my story is I spent that one year of music school after that when you're in music school, I pretty much figured out that actually I didn't need to be in, in class to get better. So I had also kind of broken my relationship with my parents because they didn't want me to go to music school. Um, that's a long story that I'll leave out, but basically I made peace with my parents and continued to work on my music by going to liberal arts college and studying something else. So I, I moved back to Boston where I grew up. I, I went to Harvard. I studied philosophy and psychology. And I was hanging out at Berkeley College of Music using Berkeley the way I was describing you know, the new school as my community of musicians that were you know, hungry, sharing music, and playing as much as possible together without ever going to class. So I, I looked like a Berkeley student. Berkeley you know, credits me with like having graduated in 1997 from Berkeley, even though I never took a single class or paid them a single cent, but I'm on their alumni news or whatever. And, and it's true that in a way I, I did really benefit from Berkeley a lot. I do owe them a lot. So, uh, and all the cats that I play with now, most of them I either met at the new school in 91, 92, or I met in Boston at Berkeley or, or NEC between 92 and 96. So that was also kind of great. 
to be uh, to have that as like my musical family. I had two musical families. So when I moved back to New York at the end of '96, I I didn't have a long transition, you know, where I was struggling to meet everybody. I kind of knew at least half the young musicians in New York, and I'd already been playing with them and uh, even doing a little touring with them while I was still in school. Um, and then through uh, through Betty Carter, I met pretty much everybody else that I didn't know because all the young musicians wanted to play with Betty and everybody was hanging around Betty and Betty was hanging around them and so I met, you know, Brian Blade and Greg Hutchinson and Alvester Garnett and uh, Marcus Printup and um, just a whole host of young guys and everybody's just one degree of separation from everybody else in the New York scene so by the time we went back to New York um, I, I was playing with Greg Tardy, great tenor player who spent some time here in New Orleans and uh, did he actually go? Did he go here? No. I think he went for a couple of semesters, you know, a long time ago. Yeah. And then uh, Mark Turner and kind of like, I was playing a lot of good tennis saxophone players. And then, then uh, Joshua Redman asked me to join his band, so I went on the road with Joshua for four years. That was kind of the, my first experience with like long tours playing at big festivals. And uh, after you do a gig like that, you're kind of on the scene. People kind of know know who you are. You're the guy that, oh yeah, you're Joshua's new piano player. That's kind of how you get labeled. And which is not a bad thing. And it's, you know, it's necessary and, and that was like the way that Brad Meldau was labeled or Peter Martin was labeled and, you know, everybody went through or, or Victor was Delphio's piano player. You know, like you get labeled as a pianist by the bands you work in, which is cool. And then eventually you work in enough bands that, that you shed that label and you just become like sideman for all these guys, which is another label. So, anyway, long story short, I played with uh, some older masters like Al Foster. I toured with Al for about four or five years, which was amazing. And then I joined Kurt Rosenwinkel's band for a couple of years. And then uh, I got a call to play with Winton and Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra for six months. I was filling out the contract that Eric Lewis had, uh, Elu, Elu, otherwise known as Elu. He had spent many years with Wint and he quit in the middle of his year-long contract. And that's the only gig in jazz where you actually have a contract. You, you commit to a year worth of gigs at a time. So he had left his, uh, his contract, so they needed somebody to come in at the last second. And Ali Jackson recommended me, and I ended up doing that gig for this. It was, it was very tricky because I was playing with Kurt's band, and I was playing with Winton's band. I was playing with Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra, which is a whole kind of research project because you have to learn not just Winton's music. I mean, you get the gig in Winton's band, you go to his management's office and they hand you a 35 CDs. You know, they oh, said, come over and we'll give you some music. Okay, cool. I thought I was like going to get some sheet music for the tune we were going to play in the gig. And she handed me 30-something CDs, every CD that Winton had ever put out or some project that he was affiliated with and Lincoln Center CDs. And that was like my homework. That's more than like eight songs on cassette. That's some serious homework. And you don't know what you're going to play and what you're not going to play, and you're kind of expected to just learn it all. It's a full time job. So I didn't have a full time job. I didn't have time to take a full time job because I was playing. I didn't want to quit Kurt's band. I had also decided that I'd missed school, so I was going to go back to school and get a master's in philosophy. So I, that, this is all just happened by chance at the same time. Um, 2005, 2006. So. I was just kind of crazily juggling everything for a year. That was, and I, I kind of burned myself out. So, um, anyway, that was about ten years ago. I eventually got my my philosophy degree. <laughs> it took five years instead of two years, but I eventually got it. And uh, I've been trying to play more with my own band and figure out if it's possible to kind of be a band leader and a side man at the same time, which is tough from an industry perspective. The industry kind of tries to force you into a box of one or the other. It didn't used to be like that. It is like that these days. So that's my little puzzle for myself. Um, Christian McBride has managed to prove that it's possible to do on a high level. So it is possible, um, but it's not that easy. And that's, uh, that's kind of my life for the past 10 years, trying to figure out how I can do some sideman gigs and collaborate with people that I love, and also kind of build my own trio and my own projects. Um, and that's a big transition that is probably important for you guys. Uh, maybe we can talk about it. Because of the internet, 
you know, you guys are forced into a certain amount of like pre-professionalization, I would call it. In a way, you know, Herbie didn't have to worry about promoting himself. He just was worried about playing his ass off and trying to play with as many great cats as possible. And you see that if you read his autobiography, he's not thinking about like his Facebook page and his Twitter and his, you know, come to my gigs, I'm Herbie Hancock, I'm so great. No, he's just <laughs> thinking about playing. And that was also true for Joshua Redman and Brad Meldow. You know, and, and me, you know, up until very recently, I didn't have to participate in the promotion of my own gigs, and neither did those guys. And during your formative years, I think it's very, very important not to think about that, because the mindset that's required to get better as a student is something like a less extreme version of, you know, I suck, how can I get better? <laughs> And the mindset that is involved in promoting yourself successfully on the internet is, I'm great, come check me out. And those two things are antithetical to each other. Those are two opposite um, philosophies of musical self. And how can you be both at the same time? How can you be self-critical to the point where you're constantly working to get better, or such that you're constantly working to get better? And how can you be like out there and talk, you know, given the vibe that you're the shit? It's very rare to find somebody who's good at both of those things at the same time. I'm not sure I can even think of one example. Maybe there are a few arguable examples. So uh, that's the problem of your generation. Um, and it's now actually that's also my problem, but <laughs> it's worse for you guys. And that's an interesting change um, in, on the scene. Did not exist. I mean, you could hope when you were my age, you know, and, I was, and you were in school, my generation, that you would get the gig with so-and-so, and that would lead to the gig with so-and-so, and that would lead to maybe a record deal. And that happened, I mean, or you could win a competition and get a record deal, that, that still exists, I guess. Um, but that's one reason why, you know, it's tougher for you guys to, uh, there's many other reasons also why it's tough. I guess that pretty much takes, that's more than 10 minutes now, <laughs> sorry. Uh, five minutes of questions, if anybody has any questions, and then let's play. I didn't realize I had that much story to tell, sorry. So what have you been listening to recently? What have I been listening to recently? Good question. Uh, I think I would say that the, the older I get, the more I tend to go back and listen to the stuff that I fell in love with when I was younger. I don't know if you guys would agree with that. But I mean, there is a reason why, for example, like Wayne Shorter's Blue Note records in the 60s, you know, caused me to fall in love with jazz. And there's a, there's a reason why, you know, Miles's records from the 50s never get old and early and 60s. You know, there's like so much amazing music that you kind of discover along the way and you fall in love with. And then you, you realize like, well, I gotta check out all the new stuff that my friends are making. And, and so I'm, I can stay contemporary. And then you do that, and, you, and some of that is great, of course, but a lot of it is not that great. And you, you still check it out because it's your generation. And then uh, you go back to the old stuff, and you're like, wait a second, do I just love this stuff because I've heard it so much, or do I love it because it's really just the best shit? And as you get older, you realize like maybe the answer is the, the latter, like it's actually just the best music. <laughs> so uh, so I, I'm kind of like less ashamed of going back and listening to it. No. Great Blue Note records from the 60s, for example. So that's, what I, that's kind of what I've been doing. Yeah. I have a question. Um, one of the things I really like about uh, your playing, one of many things, is I feel like you have a really strong foundation in, I guess you could call it straight ahead playing or, or classic jazz. And really, um, I wondered what you think about maybe students and young players these days. Do you find that sometimes there's a uh, tendency to kind of skip over maybe some of the foundations of, of learning how to play, like maybe that classic blue note type. I don't, I don't know if the term is used classic or straight ahead, and maybe, uh, yeah, to maybe skip stages. I don't know if you even think about it like that, but in teaching, um, like maybe, maybe that's always been the case, but particularly today, maybe students have a tendency to want to skip stages in the process to move towards things that are very complex. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that, or? Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, if you if you talk to 
if you talk to Winton, for example, um, you know, he will tell you that even, you know, students of my generation, you know, in the 90s, and even he himself, when he was coming up and learning the music, skipped important stages. And, and, you know, he tells the story of his own development. He said, you know, when he was already famous, uh, making his first records, you know, he, he didn't know anything about the blues. You know, he didn't know anything about Duke Ellington, didn't know anything about Louis Armstrong. And he got one of the best jazz educations available, you know, being the son of Ellis and growing up in New Orleans. And even he didn't, you know, from his own standpoint, really dive seriously into the history of the music until later. When he became an adult, he realized, like, wow, so there's not just this hole in my jazz education, but everybody's in jazz education. So there's, in other words, we're all kind of skipping stages of some kind or another. And then the question is, like, how seriously do we all need to go and check out every stage of this music? And the, I don't have a magic answer for that. I mean, the, the answer is clearly something like, as much as you need to sound great according to your own aesthetic standards. You know, should I let Winton decide, like, how much I need to go check out Jelly Roll? No, I, ultimately, I need to decide, but it is his job and, and our job as teachers to say, hey, I think you would sound better if you went and checked out some of this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this, and maybe this is what's missing from your playing, and if you check out these guys, like, you want to learn how to swing, maybe you should listen to some Wynton Kelly or some cats that swing. If you want to, you know, same way as if you want to play in odd meters, maybe you need to check out some cats that play in odd meters. You know, if you want to, if you want to play solo piano and, and sound solid, maybe you should check out some stride piano. I mean, you should mine the history of the music for all the stuff that everyone has ever done amazingly well. And then if you can incorporate that into your playing, your playing is going to get stronger. So how has the scene changed? I mean, I think that the part of the problem with why students seem to maybe like be more focused on contemporary stuff at the expense of the stuff that came before it is an internet related problem. It's a, it's a breadth versus depth problem in general. So you grew up today, you're on your phone all the time, you're checking out YouTubes, you got millions and millions of songs available to you free, whether it's through Spotify or whatever, stream, some kind of streaming or, or YouTube. And so the temptation is to try to be like, is, is to hear something and then you get linked, immediately linked, the nature of the technologies that links you to something else. So you see this and then, ooh, oh, you, maybe you check out a great Killing West Montgomery tune. And then all of a sudden you see the link to this other thing. So then you check out this other West Montgomery thing. And then there's some student that you know playing West Montgomery solo. So you click on that to check him out. And then that links you to something else, some Kurt Rosenkopf thing. So now you're checking out Kurt Rosenkopf. And you've spent maybe two hours listening to music, but you've only heard everything once or maybe half a time through. So you don't actually learn anything from that process. The beauty of that one cassette was that it only had eight tunes on it. So by listening to it over and over and over and over and over and over and over, I was eating that food. I was imbibing that vocabulary and everything that came into my brain got so deep in my neurons that when I started to play, it was in, it was in there. You're not going to get that from you know, punching your way around the internet. Um, so I think it's not, it's not that people, students today don't hear stuff from the past. I think they do, and in a way YouTube is an amazing resource. If you can control your impulse, if you can resist the, the temptation for novelty, you know, and, and actually watch the same video over and over again, you can see these guys playing, you can see when Kelly swinging and taking a drag on a cigarette, you can see the stuff and you can see the way that Philly Joe looked, you know. And you can realize, like, oh, maybe I need to model myself after him. You can learn so much, but you have to resist the temptation to check out everything. And there's been so many more years of jazz. Now everybody can put out their, CD, their own CD. There's no filter. There's no quality control. And there's no filter of record companies saying, only these guys deserve to be heard. So you have much, much more music out there now, too. Everybody you know and their brother and sister are making CDs and throwing it out there on the internet and recording themselves gigs. There's just too much stuff to check out. So you don't check out anything with the degree of depth that we used to check out stuff. Think about Charlie Parker buys his 
you know, Lester Young record, he might save for a month to get that record. And he's going to listen to that over and over and over again. He's going to put it in his collection of six records. And then he might need to save another month to get another one. And so he's only got eight records. But those records, he trust me, he knows the shit out of them. And every tune that he heard on those records, he's learned it in all, in all keys. You know, so the, I think the main difference between students now and students of my time, and even more going all the way back, is the breadth, depth problem. People are too broad, and they don't go deep, so they don't retain stuff from the past. Um, part of it is just youth, ign the ignorance of youth. You know, I had, I had a student who, for example, he, he just liked Robert Bach. You know, I was... So I, you know, I do the same thing, Bob Elton. Oh yeah, who is your favorite pianist? Oh, Robert Glasper. I was like, great. You know, who else? He's like, he's my man. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. You know, uh, have you checked out some Robert Glasper, you know, solos or anything? He's like, no, no, but I, got, I, I love this one album. You know, I was like, okay, cool. What, what, you know, why don't you choose a song, song from that album and, you know, learn one of Robert's solos? So he comes back, you know, and he's got a couple phrases of the song. <clears throat> And, uh, and I realized like he, he, he's not going to get everything he needs from Robert Glasper. So I was like, okay, what about like checking out some of the guys that Robert Glasper liked or likes? And he was like, you know, this kid was 18-year-old white kid from Denver, you know. Uh, he was like, well, who, like who? And I was like, I don't know, what about like Herbie Hancock? And he was like, well, he's dead. <laughs> and I was like, I just, I, I was like, wait, uh, that's wrong in like so many different ways. How do I even address that? So then I had to explain he wasn't dead, and even if he were dead, that wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, and then, so he agreed that maybe he should check out some, but he didn't even, had never even thought about listening to Herbie, let alone like knowing any albums that Herbie Hancock is on. And this is a kid who goes to new school. I mean, it's not, he's going to be a professional musician. He loves Robert Glasper and he's, you know, but it never occurred to him to check out the guys that Robert Glasper liked. How did Robert Glasper get to be Robert Glasper? By checking out all these guys. And then like, let alone like Mulgrew Miller, who was really Robert, I, every Mulgrew Miller gig I would go to, there would be Glasper in the front row. You know, this guy had never even heard of Mulgrew Miller, you know. So that's an ignorance of youth problem. So, we all had that ignorance. I mean, I was ignorant. I thought Gwen Kelly was some Irish kid, you know? But that gets addressed in a community of people, all of whom are deeply engaged in listening to stuff. You know, I went to the new school and there were like five albums that I encountered. I don't even remember who told me about them. It was just everybody in the school knew those five albums. I mean, I can tell you what they were now. They were like, uh, Eastern Rebellion, that record with George Coleman and Cedar that Bolivia is on. You know, everybody knew that tune, Bittersweet. Like, you play that blues, Bittersweet with a bridge. Everybody in the new school knew that tune. Smoking at the half note, you know. The Chet Baker sings It Could Happen to You, Milestones. Like, it was the community albums. That doesn't really exist anymore. I mean, so, so if you were ignorant of certain kinds of stuff, people would address that ignorance, and I think that's the, that's the job of teachers. You know? Hip the students to, to also the importance of going deep into stuff. So I try to get students to just forget about the internet. Five albums maximum for the year. Focus on those five albums. You can even just do with one album. Learn all the tunes on that one album. You'll get so much more out of that than out of surfing the internet all day, every day for a year. So, I don't know, that yeah, answers yeah. your question. I guess we should play. Any other last questions? Let's, let's play. Who would, who would like to come up and play? Please. Anybody who I haven't heard play? Yeah, come. Oh, come. Yeah. Um, no, man, that's cool. Uh, you have this shirt, man. <laughs> come. Is there, is there a drummer that I haven't heard? Or a guitar player I haven't heard? 
Like, I know who you are. I, have, I can look at you and ask you to play because I, I know. I haven't heard you. 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 I play, I play drums. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I know, I know. He's playing drums instead of working on this trumpet sound. Oh, man. <laughs> I just want um, Anybody else? like this that you kind of half know. You have now like a 10 minute opportunity to learn it by ear. So how are you going to do that? Yeah, what are you going to listen to? I'm going to listen to the bass movement. I'm going to listen to the, try to get the quality of the chords, try to get the form down. Number one thing, that was perfectly put, number one thing, the bass movement is going to teach you this tune. So you should try to sing along with the bass notes. Because basically, if you've heard this tune before, your ears kind of already know whether it's major, minor, or dominant. And in fact, the melody will tell you basically whether it's major, minor, or dominant. So if you can just hear the bass movement, the form, you're going to be able to get your way through it. Okay, let's try it.
Okay, nice, nice. Mm -hmm. So we don't have too much time, but normally I'd like to like engage you guys and get some constructive criticism from the audience, but I think in the role of having maybe another band play, I'll just try to give a quick commentary. Um, so hopefully these will be general points that everybody can benefit from. Your name was Andrew. Andrew. So anybody notice something that was interesting? When Andrew was comping, he played a lot of really hip voicings and in a very kind of hip placement. So he was kind of pushing the soloist ahead by comping the chord that was about to happen right before it happened. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but he was like, um, two, ang, 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 ang. and also he had some like inner lines happening in his voicings. There was a lot of really interesting, cool stuff with, with forward motion that was happening in your comp, and I think it was under, under his solo, was that one of the solo ones? Or maybe guitar solo, I can't remember. That was exactly what was missing from your own solo. So that uh, anticipated comping with some kind of like internal content is, is kind of what you need to try to do on your own solo, because you have a tendency to kind of play a chord, chord, line, chord, line, chord, line, chord, line, Chord, line, chord, line, chord, ding, 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 the chord, line, chord. And that, first of all, it gets repetitive, so it's, it's not interesting. But also, it makes me feel like you're not sure what chord is about to happen. So it, it kills the opportunity for forward motion. It's, it's being able to hear the next chord and guide your line, your melody line, towards that next chord that's going to make the solo uh, move forward. So I think it, that's one issue, like if you're trying not to react to the chord, but actually anticipate the chord. So I was trying to do that a little bit in my solo, but I think you were doing a great job of that. Like you could really hear that he knew the changes because from the first note, even the pickup, his line was heading somewhere. It was heading towards the next chord. And that's the art of really knowing the tune. Um, so, the other thing that piano players don't realize sometimes, which I did not realize for a while, is that it's actually your left hand, the rhythms of your left hand, that make your right hand swing. So if you're just pounding out chord, line, chord, line, it's impossible for you to swing. Even if your right hand is totally in the pocket. It's that, listen to Red Garland's left hand, listen to Herbie's left hand, listen to Ahmad Jamal's left hand. It's the left hand, that anticipated left hand rhythms, which usually fall into kind of one or two patterns. Either it's some kind of like on, two, on, on. Like a Charleston rhythm, or it's that anticipated thing that Red Garland does all the time. One, two, three. symbol pattern. So if you can lock your left hand together with that, and also in, hopefully in his snare comping too, you're going to be locked together with the rhythm section. That's going to make anything you play in this hand swing. So for you, uh, I thought your solo was magnificent. You, I mean, he really, more than anybody else, made me feel like he knew the tune, which makes sense because he called the tune. <laughs> so that's the tune he's been shedding on. So everybody should know all the tunes as well as he knows this tune, meaning you should know all the other tunes also as well as 
And what's the best way to, to do that? Learn tunes in all keys. And my, my belief is the best way to, to do this is to learn them as two melodies. So all tunes that you know, all standard tunes, you can learn them as basic like two melodies. What's the first melody? The melody we all know. The second melody is the bass movement, the root movement. That's its own melody. I've been kind of teaching like this, and then I talked to this uh, bass player, Martin Wind, who told me that, Red, uh, that uh, Ray Brown told him the same thing, that he learns tunes in terms, or he learned tunes thinking of them as bass melodies. So the melody that we really need to know as improvisers is not this. It's this. And I didn't know, I was just singing the top melody. I also didn't know what, you know, just pick a note, that's your melody note, sing the first bass note, or you can do it where you pick the note, that's your first bass note, sing the melody note, go through every tune, you know, this is body and soul. If you can sing the bass melody, you can start anywhere, you know. So here's the, here's the melody. So here's the bass melody. Sing me the bass melody. listening to the bass movement, he played a pretty good solo, right? So um, that's general principle applicable to everybody. Uh, so what's your name? Or. Or. Okay. So Or broke the number one rule of <coughs> piano, guitar, um, togetherness, <laughs> unity, which was he stood as far away as possible from the pianist, thus kind of disconnecting himself from me or him, Andrew. And two, just kind of comped away as if we were not here. Now, everything that he played was good, actually. It was kind of swinging and the chords were nice. But there was no connection between us and we're playing the same role. So we need to be very hyper aware of each other. So if you're going to set up that far away with your amp, you've got to at least come towards us with your body so, and, and pay attention to the rest of us, not just be over there doing your thing. Um, it would be just as bad if I were just over here comping all the time and not paying attention to him. It's not that the one is more important, but we have to have some conversation because we're both playing the same role. Otherwise, we're just creating mud. Um, but a lot of it is just physical. Like, if you're going to set up that far away, I understand we don't have time to really move, but, but you're also standing like behind the drums. You could use your cord and come out like, you could even be here, right? You could be, come more, come, come. Are you, are you not plugged in anymore? Yeah, I'm not it. But if you, but if, take your plug, take your plug. Okay. You're, I'm trying to prove a point, so. Yeah, yeah. Your cord is long. <laughs> your cord is long. That's a long 
<laughs> Join the band. Yeah, now we can have some communication. Even if your sound is coming out there, that's good, that's good. Look at that. He, he's now part of the band. <laughs> now that would be a totally different band. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so what did he do that was so great? Could you, could you tell he has the classic perfect bass player personality? Every time he's playing, he's looking around. <laughs> he's not just looking at everybody else trying to connect, but he's also smiling, bringing a, a good vibe to everybody. <laughs> and even if Andrew's over here just in his bubble, ignoring him, he's still like... <laughs> and he looks up to the point where then he looked up, and then it was cool, and there was a little moment of connection. Right? That's exactly what everybody needs to do. Not just bass players. Bass players are always like that. Everybody loves bass players. Everybody feels connected to bass players. The bass players that have bass player personalities work, and the bass players that don't have bass player's personalities don't work, and we don't know who they are. So, end result is all bass players, survival of the fittest bass players, are the ones that have these bass player personalities. So, you're going to do just fine, it's not just because you're playing, but also that is part of the job, being a bass player, making everybody else sound good and also feel good by connecting. So you have to connect to me and you also have to connect to him. And they did a nice job of just kind of connecting from the first minute, right? And the only thing that was confusing for him was when you were over there next to him on that side and he was kind of confused because I saw him, you were like, where do I look, what do I do, and you kind of like close your eyes and... <laughs> you know, did you yeah. feel that? Like there was some confusion because all of a sudden the band was over on that side of you yeah. and you were used to everything connecting over yeah. here. Um, so that, you know, that's not your fault. But I would say for you, you're like the example of a guy who like could really benefit from YouTube, checking out drummers on YouTube. Because especially the old school, more old school swinging drummers, you see them play and they're not moving at all. They're, they're so super centered and bang and everything. And you're kind of all over the place and your arms are up here, and you're, it's not that what you're playing isn't good, but I think it'll get more focused and centered and, and smooth and swinging if you like literally try to imitate the way those guys look when they play. And they, you know, Cobb, Philly Joe, the, you know, even Roy Haynes, Blakey, they're, they're very centered. Um, and even the contemporary drummers, you're not gonna see them yeah, moving around like that. That's a long-term thing. Uh, do we have time for one more band, or we're pretty much done? Uh, yeah, I guess we should start, start to wrap it up. Why don't you talk a little bit about your gig tonight? You, your plan oh, uh, okay. I have a gig tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are all invited. Uh, Snug Harbor, uh, eight, I guess 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. And uh, Grayson is playing bass. Grayson and Stephen Gordon is playing drums. And uh, play some of my music. And You have a new CD out there, right? I have a... Yeah, it's, it's relatively new. <laughs> we'll call it a new CD. It came out last year, and uh, it's called The Now. We're going to play some music from there. And uh, yeah, maybe Delphi will come sit in. Uh, who knows what will happen? Maybe Nicholas will show up. It's New Orleans, and anything can happen. But uh, sorry, more guys didn't get to play, but thank you for playing, and uh, thanks for inviting me.